Hello anyone, everyone, and welcome to the Week Air Review. You can call me a guy bracing himself for disappointment, because today I am talking about the upcoming Academy Awards ceremony, and specifically, the Best Picture nominees. Let's get something out of the way. The Oscars are bad, unfortunately. They also have an actual impact. They can drive interest in movies that folks have never seen or heard of, and every trailer where a person's name is connected, they'll get that uh, Academy Award nominated or winning moniker, which will just add a level of prestige to whatever that project is, whether it deserves it or not. Although this country is clearly in its waning years as a default source of global cultural export, the American film industry still releases movies that people all over the world go to see. So if the Oscars matter to the industry, and they clearly do, then they matter more generally. So it's worth at least paying attention to them. So let's do that. Because I have seen all nine of the Best Picture nominees, and even though I wasn't able to get reviews up for most of them, there were a few that I had actually started writing before time just got away from me. And I still want to say my piece. That said, I am not looking to do another 40-minute epic, so by and large, I'm going to keep these briefer than they could, or in some cases should be. For convenience, we'll do them in alphabetical order, with numbers first, because I think that's how the rule goes, but I will rank them at the end of the video, so stick around for that if you're curious. Anyways, uh, let's just jump into it. I hadn't yet seen 1917 when I mentioned it in my discussion of the best movies of the decade, and I kind of wish that I had, because I would have liked to call it out for just failing to justify its one-take gimmick, and honestly not doing a very good job of hiding it either. The masked edits in 1917 are so obvious that even my girlfriend, who doesn't really pay attention to that kind of stuff, had her own running tally that she eventually just lost count on. And a couple of the explosion-based ones are so jarring that they actually just look like cuts. A movie that's really shot in one take, such as Victoria, justifies it by having done the damn thing. You know, you're watching this drama, and then suddenly it's been 90 minutes, and there's a shootout with the cops, and even if it's small scale, you're still like, how the hell did they pull this off? And you can't help but be impressed at the audacity of the thing. But if you're faking it, there needs to be a reason beyond, I'm a good director and I can. Sam Mendes imbues much of this movie with impeccable technique. But so what? Birdman utilizes this inherently theatrical technique in an actual theater setting, giving the film the feel of a play, but with the moment-to-moment -moment look of a movie, which adds a layer beyond just being impressive. And also the cuts in Birdman are a lot better hidden than they are here. I actually do like 1917 quite a bit, and if I had gone in without the expectations of grandeur that the initial acclaim had given me, I probably would have been more gung-ho about it, because it's true that within certain scenes, particularly the deeply dramatic or specific types of action ones, the long-take aesthetic really works, adding emotion or tension to scenes that they would not have had otherwise. But there are at least as many scenes where it doesn't add anything. It just is. And the movie as a whole is not better for it. And yet, we're moving ever closer to the very real possibility that it wins Best Picture, despite absolutely not being that. <sighs> Speaking of absolutely not the best picture, Ford vs. Ferrari is the one truly unexpected entry on the list. And look, it is obscene that that film is here and, say, Uncut Gems isn't, but James Mangold's latest was a lot more compelling than I expected it to be, and it is not the worst movie on this list. Ford vs. Ferrari is interesting because of how absolutely terrible it makes Ford look, to the point where I am genuinely less likely to buy Ford anything in my life. Because the title is a lie. This movie is not about two car companies working to outwit each other in some sort of race race. No, a more appropriate name would have been Ford vs. Shelby. 
because it's a film showing how an infinitely pocketed American company crushes the men who would dare to dream of something more than the bottom line. I can't tell if it's an intentionally scathing indictment of corporate greed, but that's certainly what it gets across. And it does so alongside the most genuinely thrilling track racing sequences I have ever seen on the big screen, especially in Dolby Cinema, where those vroom vrooms are intense as hell. And I rather respect it for that. Shouldn't be on the list, though. Martin Scorsese made headlines last year by tearing into the Marvel model of filmmaking. And honestly, I have trouble finding deep disagreement with the op-ed he would eventually write expanding on the initial criticism. The Disneyfication of the industry is objectively bad for cinema as an art form, evidenced by the fact that the next entry on this list may not have even been released after the Fox merger if its director were not part of the MCU. And it's good to have someone as influential and able to control the news cycle as Scorsese talking about this, whether it ultimately changes anything or not. But let's not pretend that the man isn't doing his own disservice to the art form with his full-on embrace of digital de-aging. The first time that young Robert De Niro appeared on screen in The Irishman driving that truck, I involuntarily recoiled. My girlfriend whispered, he looks like something out of the Polar Express. And I said, no talking during the movie. And she said, we're in our living room. And then I shushed her because she was being very rude. But she wasn't wrong. While the uh, middle de tech was fairly convincing, that young De Niro was just not good. And even if the facial stuff was right, which it wasn't, it wouldn't have addressed the more fundamental problem, one that my friend Matt, who helped shoot my Hamilton music video, which you should definitely watch, told me to watch out for. The age of De Niro's movements. I don't think there's any scene that more clearly demonstrates this than the one where he throws the shopkeeper out onto the street, kicks him a couple of times, and then steps on his hand. The whole thing takes place in an extreme wide, so there is no hiding the fact that this dude probably needed a walker as soon as Scorsese yelled cut. It's awkward and unbelievable, and I cannot imagine that people weren't laughing hysterically immediately off camera. But this movie's three and a half hours long, and the really young stuff is a fairly small portion early on that is ultimately forgotten. And what makes the movie special is actually exemplified by the same thing that damns it in that shopkeeper scene, the distant, dispassionate depiction of violence. Frank makes it very clear that the act of painting houses is about as meaningful to him as if he were actually painting houses. He walks up to people, shoots them a few times, throws the gun into the water, and then probably never thinks about it again, you know another day at the office. And with few exceptions, the framing of the violence in the film reflects that. We aren't given big flashy close-ups with comical blood sprays. Watching the hits in The Irishman is so much more disturbing because the camera puts you in the position of a bystander and you watch, uncut, a couple of loud pops followed by a man dropping to the ground and not getting back up. Guns are fucking scary, and the age visible in De Niro's movements actually emphasizes that, because he couldn't have actually crushed that shopkeeper's hand, but for damn sure he could have pulled a trigger, shakiness and all. Scorsese's earlier gangster movies had a little more fun with this whole thing, but he's past that now. The Irishman isn't a romp, nor is it a fantasy. This is the story that led a man to the end of his life alone in a home for the elderly, his friends are dead, his family hates him, and he's afraid of closed doors. It isn't aspirational, even if you squint. From one monster to another. I went into Taika Waititi's anti-hate satire knowing nothing other than that Waititi, who is Jewish, was portraying Hitler as someone's imaginary friend, and also that he made exactly zero effort to do so authentically, because fuck that guy. 
I didn't even know it was set during World War II, though it being so means that Jojo Rabbit is by far the best war film on this list. And it, it's so much more movie than I had expected, adding in all kinds of bombast in its final third that I totally didn't see coming, though greatly enjoyed. But it was also much more personal. Not for the filmmaker, necessarily. For me. Because there is a version of reality, not radically different from this one, where I metaphorically marched at Charlottesville. When I was a gullible youngster, you would not believe the shit I took as a mutable fact just because it came from people I'd known for a long time. Who spent most of his time on Naruto-based discussion boards, I ended up becoming good e-friends with someone who I realized much too late was a straight-up neo-Nazi, and he would sing the praises of people who looked like me alongside those of school shooters, particularly the kids at Columbine, although there were just fewer examples back then. Did you know that uh, Columbine happened on 420, which is Hitler's birthday? He did, and told me, and, and now I'm telling you, good luck forgetting that one. At the same time, a different Naruto fan friend turned me on to troll culture, and though I never participated in any of those so-called raids, I definitely laughed from the sidelines at the poor, unsuspecting people having their days ruined for the crime of existing in a space. Their respective interests never merged in my mind, and by the time I got to high school, I was fortunate enough to find IRL friends and leave that all behind. But I never actively reflected on the whole thing until I was watching Jojo Rabbit, a film that was speaking straight to me at 11 years old, so susceptible to people authoritatively saying things, whether they have even the slightest basis in reality. And it was kind of scary to watch that and to realize that if things hadn't gone exactly the way they did, I could have ended up in an extremely dark place. I'd probably have more YouTube subscribers, though. I've talked too much already about Joker. It's not good, and we're not going to remember it in three years. Even if it wins awards, it's basically this year's American Hustle. Remember that one? Nominated for 10 Oscars? Of course you don't. Next. I find it really irritating when people clap at the end of movies. Unless you're at a premiere or other screening where you know people involved in the production are in attendance. Just why? The movie can't hear you. And yet, when Greta Gerwig's name came up at the end of Little Women, I felt an involuntary urge to put my hands together. I didn't, obviously, because I'm not the worst, but for just a moment, I understood. Truth be told, I don't really like period pieces very much, especially one set before the 60s, and especially, especially one set before electricity. To be fair, I have seen many incredible movies that fall into this category, but if you were to ask me on any given day what kind of movie I was in the mood for, it would never be one set in the era of Little Women. But I sure do love Lady Bird, so... Obviously, I was going to make an exception for Gerwig's sophomore solo effort. And I'm really glad for that. Because, wow. Any memories I had of Little Women's source material based on the stage adaptation and or high school class reading have long since dissolved. So I went into the story of the March family, and daughter Jo in particular, with no real idea of what was coming. And I was riveted from the first frame to the last. Sir Ronan really seems to be making the case for her as the De Niro to Gerwig Scorsese, etc., because this is a Ladybird-level like performance in a Ladybird caliber movie, one whose most negative feature is that I wanted to see more of it. You know, the non-linearity made sense from a narrative perspective, but at every jump in the timeline, I was so invested in what was going on that I wanted to see it all the way through before going to the next one. And while a few movies on this list are a bit long, Little Women is the only one that feels short. Those two and change hours just breezed by because I became immediately enamored of everyone and just wanted more of their lives. 
If Gerwig was involved in a spinoff miniseries about the marches, I would honestly sign up for a new dumb streaming service just to see it. Also, it's the only movie on this list that made me cry on the first watch. I feel like the biggest brand deal in literal history could have happened in the moments after Marriage Story goes to black. Just imagine, right before writer-director Noah Baumbach's name came up, if Netflix popped up a link to a service that assists to-be-wedded couples, now traumatized by the previous two hours, in getting a prenup. I mean, Jesus Christ, right? 100% conversion rate. In the minutes after that ending, I was trying very hard to formulate what I wanted to say because my movie-going companions always expect me to do this whole critical analysis thing in the immediate aftermath of movies, but all I could say was, the editing was a bit much. And it is, drawing too frequent attention to itself seemingly for its own sake, something I think best exemplified by the scene where it rapidly cuts between Scarlett Johansson and Adam Driver as they are forcing shut a gate from opposite sides. So metaphorical, I grumbled. No talking during the movie, my girlfriend mocked. Fair enough. Marriage Story makes for a really fascinating companion to Little Women, whose director was a collaborator of Bombbox on films like Francis Ha, because it effectively takes over where Little Women leaves off. Little Women, understandably, doesn't focus too much on the hard parts of relationships themselves. We do see the work that Marmy puts into helping the cause that her husband is fighting for, and also some of the difficulties facing Meg and her husband. But it's also fundamentally a story about how love is enough. And it cuts before that stops being true. Which is where Marriage Story picks up. The cynicism that I have, my complicated feelings about the institution of marriage and pretty resolutely negative ones about kids, is something that Little Women tries to soften and one that Marriage Story leans right into. And since one is a period fantasy and the other constantly reminds me of how little space there is in New York apartments while my friend in Pasadena can rent a literal house for basically the same price as this place, one of them definitely hits closer to home. Especially since there are moments in Marriage Story that specifically reminded me of conversations and arguments that I have had as relationships that arguably began too soon and lasted too long reached their pained endings. So this is not a particularly pleasant watch for me. It was an emotional roller coaster, more so than anything else on the list but it's a ride that I'm ultimately glad I took. I turned down the opportunity to work a background on an episode of Law & Order SVU as a frat bro at a strip club because I had tickets to go see Once Upon a Time in Hollywood for the second time. Now, it was in 70mm, tickets were bought before the gig was offered, and also I was seeing it with some friends who I don't go out with much, but the point is that I don't entirely regret my choice. Quentin Tarantino's latest and perhaps penultimate project was embroiled in its fair share of controversies upon release, some of which are valid, turning the only Asian character and such an iconic one at that into a joke because Tarantino wanted to knock him down a peg is pretty indefensible, and others that weren't. Seriously? We're gonna go to bat for the fucking Mansons? But even though I made a serious attempt to be impacted by the hashtag discourse on the second watch, I just couldn't. I enjoy this damn movie too much. There's really nothing deep about my feelings here. Tarantino is a talented writer-director who makes things I enjoy watching, and I enjoyed watching this. The world's got such texture and color and is full of big, fun performances, and I was totally shocked and then absolutely delighted by that ending. I don't know. I feel like I'm supposed to say more on the subject. That's really all I've got. As of the time I'm shooting this video, which is about 15 hours before it hopefully goes live, my review of Bong Joon-ho's Parasite accounts for 31% of the views on this YouTube channel. Generally speaking, if a video gets three or 400 views, I feel pretty good about it, so the fact that that one has 86,000, more than a fifth of which made it all the way to the end, 
is genuinely mind-boggling. And it's still trucking, and I'm guessing it probably will at least until February 9th. It's wild, and I'm not sure I'll ever make anything that popular again. Sad that I've probably peaked so early, but if my channel is going to have a high note, I'm glad it's that one. I've seen Parasite a couple more times since writing that review, but I don't really have anything new to add other than that I completely stand by what I said. It is a wonderful movie, and I am so happy that Korean cinema is finally getting some awards recognition over here and will at least take home the best international feature. It is long overdue, and hopefully it portends more respect for that industry in America. If this turns a tide on that, then there will have been some kind of silver lining in this year full of terrible choices and unforgivable snubs. Just a little one. Wow, look at us, making it through another video together. Uh, as promised, ranking of the films. I'd be kind of curious if you were able to guess my ordering based on what I've said. Let me know in the comments, and also how you'd rank them if you've seen them or even how you'd rank them if you haven't. None of this matters anyway. The Academy is gonna do its terrible Academy thing in three weeks regardless. Nine is Joker, obviously. And then there is a massive jump in quality to number eight, which is 1917, then Ford versus Ferrari, The Irishman, Marriage Story, Once Upon a Time in Hollywood, Little Women, Jojo Rabbit, and of course, Parasite. Nailed it. <laughs> thank you so much for watching, and thank you particularly to my patrons, my mom, Hammer and Marco, Kat Saracata, Benjamin Schiff, Anthony Cole, at Blasian FMA, Magnolia Denton, and Elliot Fowler. If you like this video, it's great. If not, I don't care. <laughs> if you want to see more, please subscribe. I hope to see you next week.